Good evening, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Florence Ostand. I'm a curator at the Barbican Art Gallery, and I had the pleasure to organize Daria Martin's exhibition in the Curve, currently on view here at the Barbican until April 7. This evening, Daria Martin will be in conversation with acclaimed film theor theorist Laura Mulvey on the occasion of Martin's commission for The Curve, entitled Tonight, The World. We're also celebrating the release of the catalogue dedicated to the exhibition, featuring an illuminating essay by Maria Walsh, The Paradoxical Gift of Another Woman's Dreams, and an interview with the artist. It's available online and in a bookshop for only 12 pounds. Um, in Tonight the World, which I'm sure many of you have seen or will see after the talk tonight, um, Daria Martin uses film and computer gaming technology to explore the dreams and writings of a grandmother, Susie Stiasny, who at the age of 16 fled her family home in former Czechoslovakia under the imminent threat of Nazi occupation. Stiasny kept a detailed and extensive record of her dreams over a 35-year period, which amounted to over 20,000 pages, initially for the purposes of psychoanalysis. Upon, as Daria says, spiritually inheriting these diary pages after her grandmother's death, Martin spent time reading through Stiasny's recollections and analysis, building a complex portrait of her ancestor, and the trauma of forced migration. Martin has reconfigured the curve as a liminal space and has created architectural interve interventions in collaboration with Melissa Appleton in this iconic space to orientate visitors in her grandmother's childhood home. She simultaneously creates intimacy and distance, a tension always present throughout the exhibition. Visitors encounter a virtual walkthrough of the modernist villa upon entering the show. And this can be accessed by all of you uh, from your computer at home on uh, the uh, address refugegame.co.uk. The original diary pages can be glimpsed through apertures in the wall and the archive includes Chesney's own annotations and drawings as well as Martin's own notes. The exhibition culminates with a color 16mm anamorphic film, Tonight the World, shot in Villa Stiasny itself, and projected onto a large curved screen spanning the width of the gallery. Martin has recreated five selected dreams in her own characteristic style, which pays close attention to color, texture, costume, and score. Daria Martin is an internationally exhibited artist living in London, and Professor of Art at the Ruskin School of Art, University of Oxford. Martin's films aim to create continuity between disparate media, such as painting and performance, between people and objects, and between internal and social worlds. She was recently awarded the 2018 German Award and is represented by Maureen Paley London. Laura Mulvey is Professor of Film at Birkbeck College, University of London. She is the author of seminal texts, Virgil and Other Pleasures, Fetishism and Curiosity, Citizen Kane, BFI Classic Series, and Death 24 Times a Second, Stillness and the Moving Image. Six films co-directed co with Peter Wallen include Riddles of the Sphinx, and with artist filmmaker Martin Lewis, Mark Lewis, she has made Disgraced Monuments and 23rd August 2018. Both Martin and Mulvey are filmmakers and academics who often bring feminist and psychoanalytic readings to their work. As artists and writers, they have previously drawn on memory, loss, separation and the maternal, which have deep resonance to tonight the world. In tonight's conversation, among other things, they will discuss experimental filmmaking, melodrama, and female legacies of creativity. I would like to thank Valeria Napoleoni for her incredible support for this event, as well as all colleagues here at the Barbican, Rita Duarte, Andrew De Bruyne, and Priya Jay. 
The conversation will last approximately 45 minutes and will be followed by questions from you. Uh, please, can I ask to turn off your cell phone? And now join me in welcoming Laura Mulvey and Daria Martin. Thank you very much for that terrific uh, introduction. I have to thank Florence uh, 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 for, well, for having curated the exhibition in the first place and also for having invited me here. And uh, it's very nice as well to thank uh, Daria uh, for having um, invited me. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how our conversation works out uh, in, uh, in, in practice. But I just wanted to say what a very rich work I think Tonight the World uh, is, how complex it is, its richness and its variety of media, its visual references brought together fra and framing this extraordinary central um, um, panel made up of the five segments of the dream films. And although other media contribute to Tonight the World, film is so central to the work, and it's going to be central to our discussion as well. And we're going to focus, not exclusively, but very much on the uh, filmic aspects of the, of the exhibition, rather um, perhaps slightly uh, one-sidedly. But I think uh, the film medium um, which, uh, with which uh, Daria has translated her grandmother Susie's dreams into a material form is also part of a long tradition of interaction and dialogue between film and dream, going back very much, as any, and people probably can recognize, to the surrealists. And one remembers the favorite surrealist uh, uh, image of the sleeping figure in a hotel room under notice on the door, poet at work. Um, but Daria draws a, on film history, on film theory, taking the initial translation into dialogue with a wide range of references that we are going to be discussing. But I think that dream is also a reminder of uh, the flexibility of film and the form of film uh, ability to depict confusions and uncertainties of time. So these uncertainties of temporality escape the linear and offer us multiple other ways of thinking about the figuration of time and the place of time in all our imaginative formations. Mm. So I want to start by, uh, although Florence gave a very uh, uh, nice description of uh, the source of the work, I'd just like to ask um, Daria to start by expanding a little bit on that introduction and talking, telling us a bit about your grandmother Susie, your relationship with her, and how she came to be uh, such an important source your work. So I think you actually said at one point it was through Susie that you came to be an artist. Mm. Yeah. Yes, thank you for that, Laura. And thank you also, Florence, for the introduction. Um, yes, my grandmother Susie was a great inspiration to me and also somebody who troubled me greatly in equal measure, one might say. Uh, she was an artist herself, a painter. She made very expansive, spacious, color field paintings, and time spent with her in her studio as a child, I think, set the foundations for my later desire to become an artist myself. Um, she was also somebody who ignited in me a curiosity about the life of the mind. Uh, she was a rather brilliant intellect, a bit um, not unlike you, Laura. Um, and, uh, <laughs> uh, but she also had a, a rather dreamy, ethereal side. Um, by the time I was born, she had been in Jungian analysis therapy for several years. And at the dinner table, she would talk to me quite a lot about 
Jungian theories about universal archetypes, these underlying symbols uh, and feelings that she thought were universal, uh, and about the capacity of delving into one's own unconscious as a means to realize one's full potential. Um, and I was aware, meantime, throughout my whole life um, uh, that she was keeping this daily dream diary, initially in support of her therapy. This went on for half of her life, for about 40 years. Um, and it was a meticulous daily process of recording every dream, uh, typed, organized. Um, and when she died, uh, this was left to us, and she had given us permission to look at it. Uh, so this vast archive of about 20,000 dreams was one starting 20, point. 20,000 dreams. But mm. can I just take you back a little bit? Because um, um, uh, Susie went into her analysis mm. when she was middle-aged mm. and was suffering from a certain depression. Yes. But there was also the legacy of her traumatic childhood. That's right. Yeah. And if you might say where she grew up. Then. Sure. Yeah. So Susie was somebody who had quite a lot of privilege in her life. She, after all, had the time to sit down and record her dreams every morning, go into analysis, paint, etc. But she's somebody who also suffered. Uh, she grew up um, the child of Jewish industrialists in Brno, Czechoslovakia. And as Florence said, when she was 16, the family had to evacuate and moved initially to England and then to Brazil and finally to California where they settled. Um, but this, this process of, of their evacuation was somewhat gradual as it is. Um, there was the gradual encroachment of um, not only, of course, the, the Third Reich in Germany, but um, Nazi ideology in Czechoslovakia uh, prior to them fleeing. Um, for example, Susie's best friend growing up um, was a Gentile and, and part of a, a fascist uh, fire camp group. And this was a point of tension, but not irreconcilable tension in their friendship, as you can imagine. And Susie was sent first to boarding school in England and separated from her parents without her mother tongue and without her actual mother for some time before the whole family were able to migrate. And this kind of trauma of her forced migration was something that one might say was put on ice for many years and I could speculate was reignited in her middle age um, when she went through a sort of crisis of severe depression that was brought on by various dramas happening in her immediate family, uh, but which I think recalled in some ways that trauma in her adolescence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, could you just to finish off this introduction to the uh, to the family background and to mm. Susie, if you could bring your own presence uh, in and tell us about uh, your return to the house. Mm. And I think I was very struck by Florence in the introduction. You say something like the house is also a protagonist of the uh, stories. Um, and just mention, mention the house and your return mm. and how that, in a sense, gave you a specific emotional relationship to the story. And however emotional your relationship with Susie might have been before, mm. this was a different kind of, um, of, uh, of sensibility about it. Yes, uh, another disturbance. Um, yeah, the two central elements or sort of triggers for the exhibition in this project were the, the diaries and, and the house in which my grandmother lived. Because of course the diaries encompass <coughs> everything from mm -hmm. her, her 40s through her 80s and recycle all sorts of references. But the five dreams in the exhibition specifically were dreams about her childhood home in, in Bruno, Czechoslovakia. And um, about two years ago, some time between Trump's election and Harvey Weinstein's um, outing, uh, I was <laughs> invited back to my grandmother's childhood home by the uh, Czech Heritage Institute, uh, who had at that point inherited the house and had renovated it 
and we're reopening it to the public as a sort of museum of modernist architecture. Up until that point, it had been handed from one government to another and was used uh, largely um, uh, to house visiting dignitaries from Prague. Um, so it was associated locally with the government. But at this point, it was being reopened to the public. And uh, my family was invited to come for the opening. Uh, and only three of us went, um, perhaps partly because my grandmother was an only child, so it was a rather small diaspora. Uh, and we showed up at, at the house, and we were greeted by a panel of well-wishers. Um, and the three of us were already far outnumbered. <laughs> and then this press corps arrived, um, a group of photographers and reporters with microphones. Uh, and they snapped pictures and asked us questions. And then we were invited out to the garden where we were asked to plant a tree and a banner that popped up as if from nowhere. Uh, we were invited back into the um, dining room. More pictures were taken. Mm -hmm. and, and then something rather strange happened, um, which uh, was that someone pulled um, out of a folder a photograph. And I recognized this old black and white portrait vaguely as an ancestor. I, I thought it was my grandmother's grandmother, which it turned out to be. And the person was telling me something in Czech. And I raised up the photo obediently, and a flash came, and the picture was taken, smiling. Uh, and only at that point did the translation to English come through, which um, was the news that this photograph was being returned to our family from the Gestapo archives, uh, where it, it had been sitting for decades um, as evidence of uh, my great-great-grandmother's capture by the Nazis. And only in this moment in which I was being photographed uh, did I learn for the first time that my grandmother's grandmother had been murdered in the concentration camps. And so that moment of, of in a sense, sudden alienation mm. from the ritual that you were undergoing mm. gave you uh, a new desire, in a sense, to repossess the story. Yes, exactly. Or it's the house and yeah. Susie and the house, the story. Yes, it was sort of in retrospect digesting all of the feelings that mm. were stirred up by this visit that made me want very much to get back behind the camera to make my own images and, um, in a sense, to reclaim the house for mm. myself, to restore something, perhaps to repair something. Um, um, I think at this moment uh, we'd like to show one of the dreams that uh, Daria has selected for our discussion. So uh, we'll try give those of you who haven't seen any a chance to see the dream, and also this particular dream is going to be a, a kind of central focus for our, uh, for our conversation. Um, so could we have the film now, please?
you could also read some of the text of the, mm. of the dream. So we can put the image and Susie's original together. Yes, exactly. So I'll skip the first part because it's rather digressive and long, but it essentially it's, uh, it begins with a discussion about um, the fussy and old-fashioned furniture in the house. And then it continues, the children who share the back bedroom with us have discovered that they can poke holes with straws into the stucco of the curving wall above the fireplace. I poke a bigger hole, and I see lots of eyes inside, like some small mammals, a nest of some kind, perhaps. I stick my, my arm in and rip a big hole and see that it is people. I call in that we are the Korean army. The kids think that this is a mistake and that I should not give them too much information until I find out who they are. Actually, the Korean army isn't us, but they are just outside the house. I poke all the way through and see a stout, small man in gray pants and sleeveless undershirt, domestic looking, as though he were just going to another small room within the wall to where his family is. And then she has some comments about it and associations. But essentially, uh, as you can see and hear, I've added some things and taken some things away. Um, one of the main changes is in the pacing of the dream. Um, in what I've just read to you, there's a, a moment in which she digresses and slows down and talks about the side conversation with the kids. And actually, I'm not the Korean army. The Korean army is outside. I've kind of elided that um, and allowed for a more, one could say, conventional mm -hmm. buildup of suspense and then deflation. Um, so no, I, ju I just thought we could start with some really kind of uh, practical but very significant uh, uh, choices that you made in, mm. in staging this. Uh, first of all, perhaps the performances, the casting, mm. who the characters are. Could you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I would say that uh, the sort of central challenge here was to lift these dreams off the page. I mean, it is, they're very vividly described in a great detail, but this is black text on white paper, um, to really embody the dreams mm -hmm. and give them sculptural heft and space and life and, and sense. Uh, so the first task is to cast. Uh, um, the dreams, and we did some theater workshops around this, and ultimately decided to, as you can see um, from this dream, but you can see more fully in the exhibition, allow Susie to be embodied only by four actresses of four different generations, uh, who also uh, play all the other parts, including the men. Um, and the boys? This, and the boys, yeah, as you could see in this dream, yeah. yeah. Um, and this started off as something of a practical consideration because we had to fly everyone out to Bruno and a nice small cast of four was quite economical. Um, but uh, also I think it hints at the sense that um, within our dreams we populate them with many figures who appear to be familiar to us but who also yes. might be parts of ourselves in a sense. Yes. But I, I also wondered um, whether that flexibility of, of gender and subjectivity had something to do with um, some of your ideas about the instability of gender in, in spectators of film. Um, yeah, I, 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 I think that there's a way in which, uh, in, in which I, I argued in my old essay that um, the uh, female spectator was absorbed into the into the masculine orientated language of the film itself. Mm. So that was to do with the actual language of film. Uh, but that was particularly about Hollywood. It wasn't about cinema in general. Mm. And here, I think you seem to be more as almost commenting on the instability of the spectator's position in film. Because mm. nowadays, I think, the spectator is much, much more uh, able to mm. shift, change, kind of chameleon-like from gender to gender, from position to position, mm. different kinds of identification. Uh, and certainly in a film like yours, I see the, the uh, 
oddness of the gender as something which is almost commenting on, playing with that. Mm. But then there's also an instability of generation as well, mm. which is not something that I've ever commented on. Okay. We can carry on, talk about something else, but do you want to say something about the way in which gender and play with gender, so we can talk mm. about play with gender then also leads on to play with intergenerational identity as well. Yeah, I mean, I think sort of a, a central part of the process of making the film was the sense of play amongst these mm. four actresses of different generations and a sense of collectively creating or recreating this figure of my grandmother, not in a singular identity, not um, one actress embodying her solely, but spread across these, well, it's really three, the three older actresses and mm. the youngest implies her without actually ever playing her. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I think this was sort of one of the most restorative aspects of, of uh, the film's creation. Um, the different generations imply different times at which she was writing her diaries, perhaps, but I think they also perhaps imply uh, generations, including her, let's say my father, or it could be my mother and myself, mm. Uh, mm. Uh, within a family. Yes. Mm. Exactly. Well, we can move on a little bit later to the actual significance of the of the drama, but um, I was very interested in the way that you seem here to be referring to um, the genre tra tradition of melodrama. Mm -hmm. um, you have the kind of comfortable bourgeois interior that you mm -hmm. associate with the Hollywood domestic melodrama, mm -hmm. um, but. Also, you have this sense that you've put into the dream, which is there in the film, in the dream, but you also put very much into the film, a sense of the uncanniness mm -hmm. of uh, uh, the domestic interior, this double side. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have things to say, I could say about this, but would you like to comment on it? <laughs> let's, let's both talk about it, yes. Yeah. I mean, certainly the house in this film is a crucible for fears and desires, as one might say it is in melodrama, yeah, that these are domestic dramas in which it's not about the protagonist, usually a woman, questing out into the world and conquering, etc. It's about um, the uh, probably suppressed longings and um, frustrations that a, a woman at home might feel mm. and how that could be played out within the family. Uh, and because the dreams within Tonight the World are selected for their containment by my grandmother's house. Yes. I was scanning these 20,000 dreams for references to Bruno and specifically to the house. Yes. All of these dreams do play out within the house, yes. so they, it is a sort of crucible or hot house for yes. um, repressed desire as well. And then there's that extraordinary, I mean to me slightly uncanny, uh, um, deco <laughs> interior decoration, seeing that this house is famous for its modernist architecture, <laughs> yes. uh, and it was celebrated in, as part of Czech heritage mm. for its modernist architecture. Mm. Um, and Susie's parents, or Susie's mother, insisted on decorating it in this chintzy Victorian way. Yeah. And I think it's that, uh, that insistence on the chintzy the sort interior, of decorative, interior, decorative yes. interior. Yes. It's uh, it's insistent femininity. Yes, absolutely. Um, at the beginning of this clip, you see the actress tinkering with one of these figurines, these ceramic mm. figurines, and and she really had crammed this functionalist house with that kind of decoration mm. and and floral curtains and all of that. So. Um, yeah, it doesn't make for a great site of modernist tourism, mm. um, the way that Villa Tugendhat, which is also in Bruno, does, and it's truly uh, an icon of, of this period, Mies mm. van der Rohe. Architecture students make pilgrimages to see it. It's, it's um, perhaps not so appealing in that sense, but as a film set, it's fabulous. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it does resonate with that kind of uh, the way in which uh, the, the melodrama constructs the domestic interior as claustrophobic mm. and, uh, and that that 
claustrophobic interior then, in a way, leads on suggestively to the idea of the interiority of the psyche mm, and the interiority yes. of the woman's um, um, repressed feelings, mm. her inability to express herself, mm. uh, which in <laughs> traditional melodrama <laughs> cri criticism and traditional melodrama feminist criticism, mm. well, actually, it goes back to Thomas L. Sessa, uh, is understood as a, a, a genre and an aesthetic of displacement. Mm. So what the repressed interior, the tense family relations cannot express between themselves in melodrama tends to be displaced onto lighting or objects like mm. Susie and the figurine. Mm. And then suddenly, in an explosion of the melodramatic ex uh, mm. excess, you have the gramophone horn, which suddenly turns into this object, mm. which then <laughs> epitomizes both the object of display, but also suddenly becomes an object of the uncanny mm -hmm. and anxiety Absolutely. and the abject, in a sense. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, you've said it beautifully, yes. Mm. I, mean, I think um, the salience of, of objects is something that has always interested me as a filmmaker, mm. the way that um, pe people can become like objects and objects can become like people. Um, and here, I think, Yes, the gramophone, most obviously, but mm. also, let's say, the, um, the toy soldier figurines, the glove that she pulls out of the yeah. hole. Um, yeah. These objects all seem to have some sort of import that um, doesn't have a narrative driver. Um, mm. I, I, I think it was Freud who talked about how in dreams, sometimes there's a unexpected reversal of, of emotional salience about than, than how one might experience something in life. So a massive event in a dream might be played quite lightly. It might not be felt so strongly as it would in life, while some small detail might fill one with horror or joy. Um, yeah. So there's something of that there, yeah. perhaps. Mm. Uh, and then, of course, the space does become uh, strange uncanny mm. and so on mm. and uh, I'd like you to just say a word here about um, just in a sense in order to move on to the space of the house is uncanny and anxiety mm. provoking about uh, the scene from the birds that you mentioned to me as a point of reference yeah so in pacing the scene that you have seen yourself here one, yeah, one inspiration was, well, it's really a whole genre of, of horror, uh, but one might locate one of the first manifestations in Hitchcock's The Birds. Hitchcock, of course, spawned great um, imitators as well. Uh, but there's a scene in which Tippi Hedren hears something, it's upstairs, she slowly approaches, she turns the door handle, mm -hmm. she looks, we look with her, there are shadows, She's fearful but curious, and we feel the same way, and she must move slowly with trepidation and caution. Mm -hmm. Finally, in the attic, she finds a huge hole in, in the ceiling, and all the birds are there, and they attack her. Um, but the, this kind of um, scene in which we move very slowly and hesitantly with the protagonist mm -hmm. towards the object of both fear and fascination. I think, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Uh, but I think that's one of, uh, it's the way that Hitchcock shoot, sh shoots it. It's called the Hitchcockian moving point of view shot. Okay, good. Where uh, you see <laughs> uh, Melanie moving slowly forwards, and then you s the camera then moves slowly forward with her. With her, with yes. then a reverse shot and so on. Yes. So gradually <coughs> incorporating us, the spectator, mm. into this very kind of, uh, anxiety-provoking, but in, um, curiosity-driven yes. moment. Yes, yes, it's the slow movement forward together, isn't it, that um, that creates that suspense. We are moving towards something that we both mm. want to see, but also dread seeing yes. somehow. Um, I think that Maria Walsh mentions in the intro in the uh, essay in the um, catalogue. Uh, the woman's film, 
mm. which uh, also struck <coughs> me in terms, it's often, I, um, uh, this is often a woman who is kind of haunted by the past or is persecuted by her husband who is inventing uh, a haunting. Mm. But that sense of the topography of the house, the attic uh, as somewhere that's uncanny mm. and not part of the house, but not part of its lived everyday mm. um, bits, as mm -hmm. it were. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that although the birds is not that genre, but there's something of that sense of the space of the house. And whether mm -hmm. that discovery of something hidden mm. uh, behind the wall mm. when um, Susie blasts through the wall, mm. kicks it down. Um, I wondered if here, you could talk about um, the significance, because I just mentioned in, in melodrama uh, theory, there's always this sense of a displacement onto something, mm. uh, of, uh, of, of, of an idea onto an object, uh, which is drawn directly from mm. Freud's interpretation of dreams. Mm. And again, I think Maria mentions, I not think, I know Maria mentions metaphor and metonymy in the essay. Mm -hmm. So if you could just talk to us a little bit about the way that displacement and condensation are working. In, it takes us across yeah. melodrama, <laughs> uh, into the dream, and into your staging of it as well. Yes. <clears throat> A lot to uh, digest there, but um, I think to start I would say that I think we all have certain dreams in common, dreams in which our teeth are falling out, dreams in which, uh, as you described, we show up to an event in our nightgown, um, and I think another very common dream is one in which we're in our own house or a familiar space and we see that there's an extra room or an extra wing to the house. Mm. There's something more to be discovered and it's surprising. And I'm sure it wouldn't take a psychoanalyst to point towards these extra rooms as referring perhaps to the unconscious or to parts yeah. of our psyches to which we don't have immediate access. Um, in terms of displacement and condensation, uh, so my understanding again of displacement uh, as Freud describes it is that in a dream um, the sort of true meaning uh, or event or feeling would be displaced onto another object to which, yes. which it resembles somehow. Exactly, and partly because the original idea is, mm. is difficult, painful, to repressed. And so it has to find a way of displacing itself onto something that can come to the surface. To, that that yeah. will appear readily. Well, I think it's condensation that's particularly interesting in this scene, isn't it? Yeah, so, so condensation meaning that there are multiple difficult feelings that all condense mm -hmm. into one symbol so that when one retrospectively unpicks the dream in analysis or, I mean, it's, it's not a, uh, so different from uh, a viewer going to see a film or an artwork and, and unraveling their own associations to it. There are multiple, multiple things that can come out of a single symbol. Um, and I think that's um, very true of the appearance of this man inside the wall at the end of the clip that you saw. Um, in fact, I, I chose the five dreams that we see in the exhibition precisely for the sense that there was at least a doubling, if not a multiple layering of meaning mm. to the main symbols there. Um, and specifically, I chose dreams that had symbols that seemed to point towards this history of the Holocaust on one hand, but also that pointed in a completely different direction. Um, so the man inside the wall uh, could be um, someone, a, a Jew hiding during the war, um, like Anne Frank did, inside walls, mm -hmm. under floorboards, and hidden, hidden rooms. He could be that, but he could also um, simply be a worker going about his life, as he seems to be in the dream on the surface. Um, my grandmother in her associations talks about 
her own grandparents being um, of this proletariat class and how one only had to scratch the surface of the wallpaper to see back to that generation. Um, so there are ways in which That's I hope so these dreams unpass. So she yeah. makes that, it, when she, in, in her self-analysis, she mm. says, this could have been my grandfather. Yeah. 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 Yes. But the association with hiding during mm. uh, the Holocaust was your association. That, yes. But one yes. that you could easily link with her. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I'm sort of applying my own level of interpretation yes. there. Yes. But it's very complex because at some point one thinks to begin with that um, there's something menacing behind the wall. Mm. So it's actually a series of, of, of shifts. It's not just two shifts. It's uh, mm. um, a number of different associations or... Yes literally condensing in that Absolutely, moment. yeah, and, and this is why the dream itself was such a wonderful found object, is that it does imply this incredible buildup of fear and then this sort of wonderful, almost comic deflation of that fear. Yes. Um, but it's interesting that it, if one were to think of it in relation to her history, it might be that she's fearing these very violent mm -hmm. attackers or intruders, but really sees someone more like herself inside the wall. This and there's an I mean, interpretation. Uh, something of interest to me, of my generation, but we needn't go into it here, is the reference to the Korean army, mm. which kind of places it completely mm. in the early uh, 50s and gives it another kind of di dimension. Yeah. But uh, uh, that's just s s some of the ways in which uh, these meanings, in a sense, kind of float and connect mm. across... Now, um, when we were talking about the melodrama, we were talking, we were talking about uh, the association with a female protagonist, mm. but a female protagonist who's very much trapped mm. in a situation mm. of which the domestic space represents that kind of trappedness mm. and also her interiority, her own psyche. Um, but we wanted to move on to the way in which um, how these kinds of stories can um, open up mm. to a more active female protagonist, mm. uh, an investigator. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that you say that Susie was a detective. Susie did detective work on her soul. Mm. So that, in a sense, introduces for us and allows us to move on to the question of investigation, curiosity, narrative, yes. and so on. Would you like to say something? Yes, about yes, that? absolutely. So I would say following on also from melodrama, women trapped in houses with threatening presences, there's also, of course, the whole genre of horror, right, of women, you know, trapped and mm. there's a killer and, mm. and ultimately they, they may very well be murdered. Um, but interestingly, I would say there's now a contemporary genre that it, you could almost say is a hybrid of the investigative crime drama on one hand and horror on the other, which is um, one in which there's a, a female uh, detective or reporter who's investigating. This, let's say this might go back to um, Helen Mirren in Prime Suspect, I'm thinking, um, who has her own troubles, right? And this has become a bit of a generic convention, hasn't it? Sorry to interrupt, uh, but you said as well that you'd been watching Jane Campion, Top of the Lake. Yes. Would that be a more, also be the same kind of investigation? Yes, yes. I mean, that, that absolutely is, um, I would say, one of the more successful um, uh, um, outings in, in this genre of, I'm thinking of TV series because of course there are equally feature films and novels written in, the, in these genres, but um, the TV series allow these stories, and it really is narrative based, to be unpacked through time. So yes, Top of the Lake was, was a favorite where you have um, Elizabeth Moss character investigating the disappearance of a young girl and over time, one realizes that the passion with which she's investigating this is bound up in her own traumatic history. And one sees 
short flashes of that history, and then they become longer and longer and build up through time until the two stories come together and, and sort of tie together mm -hmm. and reveal a new meaning. Um, and I thought it was quite interesting that this, in this new genre, the investigator is herself wounded and has her own story to uncover, which has its own horrors. So you mean there's a, a double pattern here. One, uh, the way in which the detective story is always based on going back to an earlier moment in time. Mm. So, for instance, there's moment A, when a crime is committed, mm -hmm. and then there's later moment B, from which the detective has to return, go back, and go back to the beginning and figure out how to make point A fit with point B or something like that. But also, in your mm. in the case you're describing, uh, the female detective is also self-analyzing, as, as it were. Yes. Or the film itself is investigating her own past. Exactly. There's so her there's own, a yes. double, there's an interiority, an, uh, an investigation of her interiority mm. and an investigation of some outside wound, yes. a double wound. Yes, she, yes. she's out to vanquish the murderer or the, yeah, the perpetrator, but she's also dealing with her own internal story at the same time. Yeah. And the two come together. I think that's one of the interesting yeah. parts of this genre. Exactly. Yes. Um, but I mean, this is <coughs> <coughs> really just an aside, mm. that whereas uh, nowadays you do have Wonder Woman, you know, active female uh, um, protagonists, hero heroines who become heroes, uh, traditionally, a female protagonist has m been much more a detective, going mm. right the way back to fairy stories. Mm. Uh, action hasn't been so open to her, but mm. the process of detection mm. uh, always has. And we can think of women detective story writers for, for as long as the genre mm. Mm. has uh, existed. Mm. Um, Dory, I think time is going carrying on. Mm. In, in a, um, and uh, and uh, which and so I'd like to move on to a, another uh, series of questions, mm. but also uh, just to um, recapitulate a little bit where we are, uh, which is the way in which the dream itself confuses time, mm. confuses objects, and um, uh, fragments into a puzzle which someone the dreamer or the psychoanalyst has to decipher. Mm. So there, and also in the melodrama, uh, the theory has always been that the spectator is a decipherer of what's happening on the scene, mm. screen, sorry. Um, so in a sense, what I'd like to bring together is this idea of uh, the decipher, a deciphering spectator, mm. um, a deciphering investigator, but also, as you pointed out, the way in which the detective genre confuses time. Mm. It's about temporality. Mm. Mm. Yes. <clears throat> Is this a good time to bring in afterwards, Ness? Well, I'd just like, <laughs> before we get to that, I'd just like to ask you a couple of things. Mm. Do we have how much? We've got five minutes. It's a bit of a challenge. <laughs> um, <laughs> we could take it. Five, five minutes, we can do it. Um, but I did want to ask, before we just round up with questions of time, I'd wanted to mm. ask Daria to talk very specifically about the way she worked uh, with um, her own practice and her own theory and practice. Mm -hmm. And so questions of how she uses the camera, does she think about the... You, sorry. You're here. <laughs> uh, uh, do you think about the, ga the gaze of the camera? Do you hmm, think about sure. my old theories and things like that? Absolutely. Um, and I think, hmm, uh, where to start? In some earlier films, I very strongly and almost didactically contrasted um, a voyeuristic gaze, uh, one in which a wide-angle camera with a great depth of focus takes in the whole scene at once. It can kind of master mm. the whole scene. Um, and I, I quite 
clearly contrasted that with another sort of camera's gaze, which was much more haptic and caressing and intimate and intersubjective, you might even mm -hmm. say. Um, I mean, I think in this film, those types of looking have integrated more. Um, but one kind of shot that might be interesting just to mention is one that appears twice in this clip and once elsewhere in the film in which the protagonist enters her own point of view. I don't know if you all noticed those moments, but it creates a rather uncanny effect. Mm. So what one has is you have the protagonist looking, cut to her point of view, possibly moving with her, and then unexpectedly she enters that mm. shot. Mm. It's, it's not my invention, I think maybe Tarkovsky invented it. Mm. Um, but it, it creates a, a strange moment in which um, she becomes an object of her own gaze. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so that's something I, I thought about in this yes. clip. Mm. And that's very appropriate also for the dream, because in a sense, yeah. in, in a dream, the dreamer is the object of their own Mm. gaze, mm. in a sense, mm. or a very shifting subjectivity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think also here there's a, a destabilization of the, of the gaze, in a sense, as we talked earlier about the unstable gender identities, unstable generational identities, mm. the, the gaze itself also uh, shifts around. Mm. Um, and I wanted to, to talk to you a bit about, and perhaps this can, if we leave out some of our um, topics, but this might lead us on to the question of time and afterwardsness, yeah. which is about uh, the relation, which I think is very important in this particular work, between uh, the public and the private, or rather put it the other mm. way around, how the private becomes public. Mm. Uh, and in a sense, Susie has done one step of the work. Mm. She's recorded her dreams and her interior experiences. Mm. But that's still, as it were, a private, personal, mm. uh, family restricted thing. And in a sense, what you've done is found a way of making these pri private um, private emotions mm. and experiences into a public discourse, which means that we are now sitting here with uh, an auditorium full of people mm. talking about Susie and her dreams. And in a sense, that's the magic of the Tonight the World uh, mm. uh, project mm. that you've carried off. So I think there's a relationship of time here, of going back, you know, mm. the same way as we were talking about before, but also uh, a way in which um, one can tell a woman's history, mm. and whether you could comment on that. Yeah, and I suppose it's, in a sense, it's two women's histories rolled up in one. It's mm. hers and, and mine, mm. uh, and her dreams receive my projections. You could talk also about there being two private archives. We've discussed this. Um, one being obviously these 20,000 uh, dreams uh, hidden from view until they were cracked open after, after Susie died. Um, the other being a, a, another, as you might say, informal uh, or invisible archive, which is my own emotional experiences and memories um, sort of filed away over the years. Um, and one of the ways in which I've been thinking about this project is to do with transgenerational trauma transmission, mm. um, somewhat technical term, but one which implies larger historical traumas um, impacting on someone personally and that being passed generationally. So perhaps it would be helpful to give a sort of anecdote as an example. Um, the psychoanalyst Gerard Fromm in his book on the subject, uh, Lost in Transmission, uh, describes a New York City Santa Claus uh, going about his business um, in December following 9-11. And um, 
couple months after this attack on the World Trade Center, his perceptions of the way that parents were dealing with their children completely changed. He says that you know, from behind his um, mask and, and, and beard, he could see this radical difference in the behavior of the parents. They would not let go of their children. They were clutching their hands with anxiety. So this is one example of the way that a large trauma you can, you know, it's, it's intuitive, isn't it? Can trickle down and, and affect the way that parents are, are parenting and this in turn affects the children. So I received those kind of messages from Susie through my life as well as receiving these great gifts of her creativity and, and artistic sensibility um, and interest in, in, in the interior life. Um, you know, small messages that might be absences as well as disturbing stories, a whole host of things. And these create a sort of invisible archive, you might say. Mm. Um, so I would say that this project is about bringing both of those to life in, in concert yeah. um, and to the public. Yes. Yeah. And so that is, in a, in a sense, uh, using Susie as your archival material, but then also the way in which she impacted on you mm. gives the emotional drive, as it were, to make the process uh, a work of art. Yeah, I mean, I think works of art can perform that process of, of repair, even as they also um, dig in and, and create new, new ruptures. It's yes. a sort of dual process. Um, and We've talked about, I think, perhaps we can bring in one last idea of the afterwardsness now. Yes, yes. and then I'm going to ask you one last question at the end. Yeah. Okay, if we can, <laughs> I can but do talk if about you can, If you can tolerate. Yes. Um, so, um, yes, so the psychoanalyst Rosina Perelberg, amongst many others, describes a process in an analytic session that she, she talks about it as dynamic afterwardsness, which is also <laughs> referred sometimes as après coup in French. It's translations of Freud's term, deferred actions, another translation. And this is a moment very much like these crime dramas I mentioned earlier, in which um, a, a, a present day trauma or crisis ignites memories of an earlier one which is then given a new meaning, mm. transforms the present. Um, and one can see this, this moment happening in two directions. One is moving forward in time so that trauma one um, is, not, is put on ice. It's not experienced fully until trauma two. So moving forward in time is deferred. That's the translation um, by, by straight sheet that implies moving forward in time, deferral. But there's also a retrospective movement, which is trauma two, again, triggers feelings and associations to trauma one and gives it a new meaning mm. again. Yes. So there's a, a dual direction. And um, you see that played out in these crime dramas in which yes. these flashbacks build up and then suddenly, you know, the sort of revelation comes through. Um, that's the sort of conventional narrative way of addressing yeah. this. I think in um, this project, time has collapsed into one. So we don't so much have that narrative progression to the moment of simultaneity. Rather, time frames coexist. We have 1950s and 1970s and um, 1938 all rolled into one yeah. in a sort of yeah coexistence. But, uh, but <clears throat> um, but actually, I mean, rather than it, the concept of uh, afterwardsness being embedded in the work itself, mm. it's also in your process. Mm -hmm. So uh, the the afterwardsness is your working through of the unassimilated experience that is located somewhere in the mm. past. Um, and just to give the La Planche 
uh, definition. The past has something deposited that demands to be deciphered, mm. a message from the other person. Mm. And for me, that relates very clearly, in a sense, for how you, uh, in perhaps a painful as well as in a liberating way, have, in a sense, uh, been um, the person on whom that demand to decipher mm -hmm. has been left as your, it's Susie's legacy to you. you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. So uh, even if you're, it's not quite clear in the actual films, it's there, I think, in the relationship of time uh, that's there written into the process. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Florence, can I ask her one last thing? <laughs> uh, I think that from a theoretical point of view, uh, this work has uh, a lot of relevance to thinking about time and history mm. and uh, how we can envisage and imagine uh, perhaps a feminist alternative histories and how they might be told. But apart from that theoretical side, I wondered if you felt that Susie and Susie's story and your work that kind of now quite remote historical experience has present relevance. So mm. if someone said to you, hmm. how would I relate to Susie, sure. so Susie's story in terms of the kinds of traumas of, of that people are living through today? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, that might be a, a nice segue to opening to, to our audience to hear what their resonances are. But I, mean, I think that, um, I think everyone could relate to some sort of exile, whether it's simply from you know their childhood home to go away to university. I mean something as as mundane as that, or from their mother's breast to greater independence. Um, uh, but of course, yeah, this encroaching fear of of the other, whether it's um, the far right's fear of migrants or um, our own fear of the far right. <laughs> Is, is something that we're all anxious about mm. now, isn't mm. it? Mm. Um, so that sense of, 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 a, ret of, of a return of an anxiety now, mm. which should actually spark a return to a decipherment of the past, mm. and perhaps is insufficiently historically examined. Mm. Perhaps people would like to ask, um, I mean, this isn't just questions, it's just points or thoughts that people would like to make. Uh, thank you for your talk. I was just wondering about one small thing. Um, I wanted to know what was Susie's mother tongue? What was her first language? I guess Czech. German. German. German, so yeah. She, yeah. And uh, in relation to that, the dreams were written in English? They were, luckily. I don't yeah. speak German. So when, when you opened, uh, when you opened uh, when after she passed away, were you surprised that they were written in English? You were always communicating. And was um, I wasn't surprised they were written in English because she was one of those migrants to the US, like my grandfather, who was Russian, who um, in a way forsook their, uh, their, their native um, nationality. Um, and it was another subtext to the story is that she didn't really talk about this history. You know, there were a certain canon of stories about her childhood that, in my experience, didn't really include the flight from Bruno. Um, and it's the very silence around it that wanted me to, to fill in um, the gaps through reading the diaries. I just thought, uh, thank you. I thought it's fasc fascinating that something so private and intimate, such as dreams, was written in maybe something that was initially alienating. I mean, uh, like a foreign language, but then with time becomes homely in a way. Mm. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, going back to that conversation about public versus private, um, my question is that why did Susie kind of keep these dreams to herself throughout her whole life if it was so, you know, it was so vital to her existence? Mm. And also, did she deal with this in her own work as an artist in, a, in mm -hmm. some kind of fashion or way? Yeah, those are really good questions, and I'm 
not sure I have the answer to them. Sh I suppose she we could say that in the first instance she was in analysis. So she yeah. was probably in dialogue with her analyst. Yeah. Is was that true? That's true. So yeah. so they yeah, the recording was initially sparked by the need to bring these dreams into analysis twice weekly. Um, and in the earlier diaries, there are also accounts of the analysis, which is quite interesting. And sometimes she describes the discussion of a dream. But then conspicuously, she carried on for another 25, 30 years with, with the dreams. And it's a good question of, did she ever want to share them with someone? I mean, her um, acquiescence to our request to look at them is kind of surprising, given how private they are. Uh, actually, in retrospect, but maybe in a sense she wanted them to have an audience. I mean, there's always that question with any kind of diary keeping about whether the writer has an audience in mind. Um, but certainly, from my perspective, part of my impetus to make something of them is that this was this massive body of work. I mean, this tens of thousands of pages of really intricate thought and description um, and wonderful images. And it seemed as though in another um, iteration, they might have become and been transformed into films or plays or poetry or novels, but weren't. Um, I mean, her painting was quite different. It was very abstract, very open, full of space, whereas the diaries are very you know, dense and intense. Um, the paintings were quite bright and had a sort of generally a rather positive mood. Um, sometimes the diaries are quite dark. So they seem to perform different functions for her. I wouldn't say there was so much overlap, but they were both ways of investigating um, her feelings. Yeah. Have we got a... I was, um, I was wondering. Um, in, in the video, in the film, there was never um, direct... I, I can, can you? No, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> oh. yeah, it does, it does. There was a <laughs> <laughs> Could you speak up, please? Um, there, was, there was direct physical... There, there wasn't any direct physical contact between the characters. There was more um, the transference of objects. Is there a reason mm. for why there wasn't any physical contact with them? It's because um, you studied the mirror touch of synesthesia before and uh, to completely avoid mm. the matter was quite interesting in that sense. I'm just trying to think if that's true of the other dreams, but I think it actually is. That's interesting. I, I actually wasn't aware of that. Thank you for, <laughs> for noticing. Um, hmm. What did he say? That, that the... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, this the, is the deaf person. <laughs> he, the, the, the he pointed out that the people don't touch, touch each, other, each other. And yeah. I think that's, mm. that may be true in all five of the dreams, uh, actually. Yes. That's very odd. Um, hmm. Yeah. Um, well, that's right. In, in, so I, I had indeed um, worked prior to this project on um, several films about mirror touch synesthesia, which, but however, that's also about feeling at a distance. So this kind of synesthesia is one in which um, people observe others touching and they feel that touch virtually on their body. They feel it. It's kind of heightened empathy. But really, that, you know, that's also a condition in which you can remain at a distance from someone and still feel um, affected. Now, think about the actors not touching. That's interesting. Mm. Um, there are lots of questions. Have we got another microphone at the back? Um, hi, I was just wondering if you could describe in some way the, um, the process of reading the, the dreams and then going into the images, uh, whether there's the film images or, yeah, how, how, how was the translation between the words, the language, becoming then these images on the screen, like for you personally? Um, well, I think I've, I've described some of the sort of practical mechanisms and references in translating this particular dream to the one you've seen. Um, but I suppose for me personally, it 
was a matter of, well, first, I read through many of them. Um, I called about 300, which you see in the exhibition, that pertain to Bruno. And then, um, yeah, siphoned that down to five, based partly on this theme of intruders and entrapment. And then I think what happened was that I, I read them in detail, and then I put them aside, and in a sense, remembered what I remembered. Um, and the most salient parts of the images came through, wrote a script, and then went back to them again to see what I had forgotten, perhaps to integrate aspects of it. Um, so it, it really did go th through a filtration process with my own unconscious, actually. Mm. Um, I feel that nothing is more frightening or more brilliant than the human mind. When you were reading through your grandmother's dreams, were you at some point incredibly frightened yourself and perturbed by her nightmares or say, did you feel like an invader and did you feel almost uncomfortable being in such an intimate position with your relative? Yes, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, it was, it was um, um, a process that was, I would say, very much akin to this approach to the, the sounds in the wall that I was descri describing earlier in, in these sort of suspense horror movies. It was um, one in which I was completely drawn in and very curious, but also um, um, afraid of what I would find. Um, and yeah, I did find a lot of disturbing material, and um, that was difficult. But it was also, it also helped me to make sense of some things. Um, uh, so it was a strange feeling. It was one in which she was revived in a somewhat uncanny way. I felt as though I was there with her, reading these dreams. But I, I did, I did discover aspects of her that had remained latent in my consciousness until that point. But mm. I think you've also mentioned. Uh, uh, somewhere that, uh, where again, in perhaps another metonymy, mm. you have associated the sense of uh, the intrusion of mm. the, from the outside world into Susie's world mm. was something that you were echoing and that you were intruding. I don't know if that relates to the point you were making at the back there. Yeah. 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 Yes, I mean, this, this occurred to me only gradually, that I was making all of these dreams, dream films about intruders, and that I myself was another intruder in the house and in, in, into the diaries. Um, I was thinking about the moment in this clip in which Susie approaches the hole in the wall and looks through, and it's actually an image lifted almost um, quite literally from, from Psycho, with Norman Bates looking mm. through. The, and so it's a very kind of, you know, the original image is obviously very disturbing and voyeuristic. Um, but yeah, you could say that the films depict Susie looking into her future. What is that thing coming? Uh, but they're also me looking into this past at the mm. same time. Um, and trying to reckon with what this, what, what this thing mm -hmm. is. But there's an element of intrusion there, for sure. Yeah. Um, at the risk of sounding melodramatic, <laughs> do you think Susie haunts that house? Or haunted that house through her dreams? And maybe you might come to haunt that house as well through doing this project. Um, well, I'm glad you're left with that impression. Yeah. Uh, I don't feel she haunts it when I'm there. Um, again, the house feel, felt quite emptied of authentic affect when I visited it two years ago. Um, but if, if you are left with that impression, then that, yeah, that, that um, satisfies me that this ambition to go back and restore restore her psyche somehow to the house has, has partly been accomplished. Um. Can we have one last question, please? Um, how has this process made you view your own dreams differently? 
Very good question. <laughs> <laughs> Might not be very appropriate, but it's a very good question. <laughs> 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 I'm not sure it, it has an anticlimactic answer because I've, I've, I mean, Susie always instilled in me this, this, this very strongly held belief that dreams are a window to one's soul, to one's greater self, to greater knowledge about oneself and even the world. So I've always paid attention to them, but my dreams are, are really quite bland compared to hers, which is <laughs> part of the appeal of staging her dreams. Is that it? Yes, uh -huh. yes, thank you everyone. Can uh, we just uh, have a round of applause for Daria and Laura? Thank you.